This is a story to imitate, not the part of the sin, but the recovery. As we move into the land of strength, as you personally take new territory in your life during this season, and we together helping to revive our nation to take back the land, let's avoid sin as much as we can. In this process, we learn about forgiveness. In this process, we learn what happens when we begin to turn from our sin and recognize what's happening in our lives. The first thing that Ezra encourages us to do is step one, admit your sin. Everyone say, admit. Yeah, admit your sin. David says in verse 17, wasn't I the one who gave the order to count the people? David's saying, this is my fault. I caused this. David is singing the famous song, hi, it's me. I'm the problem. I'm glad that you don't like Taylor. <laughs> I mean, God loves Taylor. I love Taylor. <laughs> Side note. The lesson of the sense is the principle that God wants us to learn is that God relents when we repent. And admitting our sins is the beginning of repentance because admission is a change of the mind. Oh, I thought I could get away with this oh, I didn't know I shouldn't do this, or I did it anyways, and now we're changing our mind, which is what repentance means, to say, I messed up. I'm owning this. Which leads to the second part, which sounds very close to it, is to take responsibility for your actions. Admit your sin and take responsibility. The second half of verse 17 says, Lord my God, please let your hand be against me and against my father's family, but don't let the plague be against your people. Before the plague, David says, please don't let me fall into human hands. But after the plague started, he says, let your hand be against me. I need to pay the price. Every recovery begins with taking responsibility. We must own what we've done and be willing to shoulder the responsibility for the harm that we've caused. To do the third step, which is to make things right. I need to own it to the extent that I do whatever is necessary to make it right. How do you make things right? Well, first of all, admit your sin, take responsibility, but sometimes you don't know what to do after that. Like, I'm sorry, uh, what, what can I do? Here's what I would say to you. Do this every time, in every situation, what David did. You know what he did? He listened to God. Sometimes on the road to recovery, we admit our sin, we take responsibility, and then we listen to the world's solutions, to talking heads, Shows that we used to watch like Jerry Springer and Dr. Phil and Oprah. Counsel from the world, right? David listened to the word of God and God gave him specific instructions. So what happens? Listen to this closely because this is how you get close to the heart of God and find strength. So the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go and set up an altar and uh, to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. God tells Gad to tell David to set up an altar. This is his punishment. This is him taking responsibility. The price he must pay is to set up an altar. And you may be thinking what David was thinking. Huh, that's easy. I can do that like in two hours. I got to collect some wood. got to collect some stones. I got to build a platform. Boom, done, God. Have I achieved the minimum to get your grace? Let me read the scripture again. So the angel of the Lord ordered Gad to tell David to go and set up an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite. Do you think that when Gad asked David to set up an altar, that God's intent was for David just to do the minimum? Just set up the altar and, or do you think that God implied and expected something else when the altar was built? Here's hoping that David would sacrifice and worship there at the altar. Let's think about this again. Ezra is teaching us what to do when we've disobeyed God and pushed him away. He's teaching us how to recover when we've sinned, no matter how minor the sin might be. Now, with the rest of the chapter that we just read, David didn't just set up an altar. What David did is the last point on our roadmap of recovery. He did more than God asks. If you want to say it another way, he lavished his love upon the Lord. He didn't do just the bare minimum. If you want to get close to God, be obedient to what he's asking you to do. But if you really, really want to be near the heart of God, do more than he asks in terms of lavishing your love upon him. David will forever be known as a man after God's own heart. It's in the scripture. 
He's a man after God's own heart because more than anything, David wanted to please God. And to please God, he treated him like the most precious possession on the earth. He goes and he sets up this altar. He offers a sacrifice and he pays full price for the animals, the wood. He even buys the field to make a sacrifice, paying 15 pounds of gold. That's a lot of pounds of gold. Anybody been watching uh, Gold Rush on Discovery Channel? They weigh it out at the end. You know what I'm talking about? They say the price. 16 pounds times 15 ounces per pound is 240 ounces. Gold's like $2,500 an ounce right now. That's $600,000 that David is willing to pay in order to lavish his love. The guy was going to give it to him for free. You're like, ooh, sweet. I can just take the freebie. And David said, no, I will not bring that which cost me nothing. Here's $600,000 to buy the field the wood, and the oxen. Woo! Ezra is showing us here that once David comes around to owning his sin and taking responsibility for it, he does not only what God asks, he does more. He goes above and beyond. And I want you to know that God is touched when we act lavishly towards him. I don't know if you remember, in the New Testament, Jesus says this one time. He's like, hey, write this down so it's remembered forever. What is that in regards to? It's the time that the woman comes with three months worth, uh, her, her perfume costs three months worth of wages. Super expensive. She dumps it on Jesus. The disciples are like, this is a waste. And Jesus says, write it down to be remembered forever. She poured out her love on me lavishly. And I want the world to remember it. Do more than the minimum. David insists on doing more than the minimum. Verse 24, I insist on paying full price for I will not take to the Lord what belongs to you or offer burnt sacrifice offerings that cost me nothing. When Ezra writes, he writes stories that we never want to repeat. Lessons like, oh, don't do that. And then he also writes stories that we want to imitate for the rest of time to do over and over again. This is a story to imitate, not the part of the sin, but the recovery. As we move into the land of strength, as you personally take new territory in your life during this season, and we together helping to revive our nation to take back the land, let's avoid sin as much as we can. Let's be holy for he is holy. Let's take serious the reverence of God and to fear him appropriately and do what he says for his glory and for our own benefit, right? However, when you sin and you will, let's be like David. Let's thrust ourselves on the mercy of God. Let's admit our sin. It's hard to do in America. We want to hide, a, hide a, what do I say? Uh, show the best, hide the rest, right? I don't want to tell you my faults. I don't want to com confess to you, but James chapter 5, verse 16 says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other and you will be healed. There's power in bringing to light what has been kept in the dark. There's something today you may need to admit to somebody. You can start with God. God, I'm, I've been doing this wrong. Then take responsibility. And there's a responsibility that Jesus has already taken for us. Right? The grace of God has taken away the penalty of our sin, but the power of sin, the consequences of the things that we have done, when we begin to take responsibility, means, hey, there's some things I need to make right. Don't just say to somebody, I'm sorry. Do something and do it lavishly, over the top to show, man, I really mean it. I have messed up and I'm making it right. Right? 